This is the In the Rabbit Hole episode archive project. What you're about to watch and listen to is a past episode from In the Rabbit Hole Urban Survival Podcast. You can learn more by visiting intherabbithole.com. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel now. And now, two guys who survived a complaint from the Better Business Bureau for bringing too much sexy back to survival, Aaron and Jonathan. Howdy, and welcome to episode 65 of In the Rabbit Hole's Urban Survival Podcast. In the last episode, we helped you with your preparedness spring cleaning. This week, we help you with the preparedness spring cleaning of your mind. We're your hosts, Aaron and Jonathan, and you are in the rabbit hole, safe and sound. Today's show is sponsored by Cat's Coffee. If you're looking for truly exceptional coffee to help you survive the morning or the next zombie apocalypse, you need to be drinking Cat's. They specialize in the finest coffee from sources that prioritize environmental responsibility and are fair trade certified. Their goal is to achieve perfection in every cup. Check them out at Cat's, K A T Z as in zebra. Coffee.com or click on their bright green banner on the site and make sure you're dealing with an official sponsor of the show. Again, that's cats, K A T Z as in zebra, coffee.com. So, John, what is chicken shit bingo? Well, it's, it's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, there's a large area, there's a chicken, there's numbers painted in the area, chicken wanders around the area. You drink lots of beer, the chicken shits on numbers, and that's the number that's selected. <laughs> and yes, yes, it's an actual thing here in Austin. Uh, I'm going later today. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> take, just take a couple quick snapshots. I got to see this. Yeah, I'm going to take some photos with the iPhone and I'll send them around. Uh, maybe we'll even post one or two. Um, <laughs> it's... Uh, it's different, but it sounded just weird enough that I felt like I had to go. Well, yeah, I mean, weird. I mean, who doesn't like going to weird stuff and seeing weird Ex- things? Exactly. And I mean, come on. It's a game called Chicken Shit Bingo. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and while our audience is wondering what in, what in blazes, why are we telling you the story? One, because, well, it was just so funny. We had to share it with you. And, and two part of the, the show topic in a way, which is survival mindset. And I think as we've said several times in the past, if you're not smiling and laughing, well, then what's the point in surviving? So we thought we'd start off, as we usually do, something kind of funny. And that, and in our end of the world survival community, we will definitely have <laughs> weekly chicken shit bingo. <laughs> I mean, you got to do something with those chickens when they're not laying eggs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I Because... That that's only really about thirty minutes out of the day that they're doing that. The rest of the day, they really are just walking around and chitting. Exactly. So all you have to do, you know, chalk some numbers on the ground, and you have your own survival game. Now, Jason McCall and I have something to do at the ITRH farm. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I wonder if we brings a whole new meaning to tea night. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So let's start off with and the idea behind this show today, which is. Prepper mindsets, and there, and there are several key things that we want to talk about today. But we're going to start off with something that we actually talked about last week uh, off the air. This was a conversation between John and I, and something that came up, and and I was kind of like, yeah, I've seen that before too, and it really aggravates me. And so the the first mindset that we want to talk about, and and we've we've talked about this in general before, but not maybe in, in this exact way, but it's that, yeah, we're not trying to beat a dead horse here or anything. This is, no, this is just a way to think about things. Beating up a totally we've said, new like, horse. A, like Aaron said, we've said this particular thing before, but we're going to come at it from a slightly different angle. Yeah. And the idea is that gear is not skill. And so John and you have a story which touched this all off. Yeah, it's, I, the story kind of goes in a few directions, but I'm going to I'll try to keep it brief. The, the idea is a, a friend of mine, a coworker, colleague, 
uh, knows that I, I shoot a lot, knows a little bit about the show. So asked, you know, uh, he said, I'm buying a shotgun for my house. And now I don't have to worry about getting robbed. <laughs> and as soon as I heard that, like alarm bells just are going off in my head. Now, again, this is a coworker. He's an acquaintance. He's a uh, somebody I know, but I didn't want to sit there and go through a whole spiel or, or start a rant. But my first thought was, you have a shotgun, so now you won't get robbed. Actually, that's not the way to think about it at all. The shotgun provides you nothing except a tool. There are other things you can do. And I did tell him a couple of things like, hey, you know, you live in a house. You might want to think about some exterior lighting, maybe put an alarm system in, little things like that. The shotgun is just a protection mechanism if you happen to be there when your house is uh, being robbed. <laughs> it's not going to stop anything, though. And, you know, Aaron, you brought up a couple of good points about it, too, you know, around the idea that, you know, people constantly think that if I have this tool, then nothing's going to happen to me. Yeah, it's the I, I like to, to call it the uh, the child. Uh, uh, I just went brain dead for a second. The ch- the the safety blanket. Idea. Yeah, it is. And that as children, we many of us, when we were very young, if we just wrapped ourselves in security blanket, that was the word I was looking for. Yep. If we just wrap ourselves in this blanket, the then monsters. Well, then you're safe because the monsters right. can't get to you through that <laughs> through that Ex- magic blanket. Exactly. And, and I, you know, I, I used immediately thought of the analogy of well, I guess if I have a shovel, then anytime I need a hole, it'll just be there. <laughs> That's- <laughs> That's pretty good. And and when you first told me the story about the shotgun, all I could think of was, does that shotgun also come with a sign that you then hang on the outside of your, like a big neon flashing sign on the outside that this home is armed. And then the robbers driving down the street deciding which house to pick are going to go, oh, oh, OK. That you know guy, what, though? That's not a bad idea. I'm going to go get myself idea. a neon sign that says <laughs> this house is armed. <laughs> Which probably presents a separate set of issues for yes. for for different kinds of robbers, but I think the point is more going back to the security blanket idea is that that gear and and this has always been my real issue with gear in in speaking about it is that people have this tendency, and I don't exclude myself or you, Jonathan, no, from, no, yeah, from exactly. this conversation. We've both done it too. Of if I just have this thing, and after I was thinking about it. There was, uh, at, at one point, and we still really love knives, but at one point we were really obsessing over survival knives and stuff. And it dawned on me the other day while I was driving, I was like, that is so funny because at that point I was so worried about what is the best, most amazing, most rugged, most durable, most into the world zombie apocalypse knife I can get. That's just going to do everything. The end all beat all. And during that time, I don't know that it actually crossed my mind that I should learn how to actually use the knife. And therefore, dude, you see, you bought the wrong knife. Mine came with a small Bushman and a ninja. So and you got a ninja too. Yeah, I got two for all my needs. The Bushman, you know, he can handle the, the craft stuff uh-huh, and the ninja, uh-huh. any defensive issues. Yeah. So I'm covered with my knife. You apparently bought the wrong knife. Evidently, I did. I you need to share that with me, and we'll we'll put it in the show notes today, where where Jonathan bought his magic knife from that came with a, with with its very own Bushman and Ninja. Is is that like the backpack you bought that came with a Sherpa? Yes, exactly. The, like the, the backpack that the, came with the hundred Sherpa. pound backpack you bought that came with the Sherpa. That's, man, that's... Uh, and and by the way, the backpack just happens to be fifteen by twenty feet. Wow. Yeah, he's a very large Sherpa. <laughs> Evidently, <laughs> or maybe he's like that Mega Man character from when we were kids. That cartoon. Yep, yep. Well, he stores up small. He's kind of like the Hulk. Oh, oh okay. He kind of expands out. That's fascinating. Just soak him in water. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, but um, actually, no, I remember where I was when I was thinking about it, because I was actually I've started a project where and I, I've been meaning to do it for a long thing. There's a th- there was a uh, I wrote an article about the guy, a review about the guy's book. And the guy's name is Morse Kochansky. Who I think if you've been in like more bushcraft survival for a long time, it's it's a name you would know. But if you're just more into just general preparedness, it's maybe not a name you would know because you may not have an interest in bushcraft per se. But I started really sad. He has a uh, thing that he calls a tri stick, and it's essentially it's it looks kind of like a walking stick, and the object is to try to use as many different bushcraft 
carving techniques, notches, and different things in this stick, and it's a way of practicing those that skill. And so that's one of the things, and I'd had it on my survival chi plan that I was going to finally sit down and really do this whole stick in the on the rabbit hole forum. And so I finally started doing that and have dedicated about 45 minutes a day, five days a week, where after I come home from work, that's my way of blowing off some steam, is to sit on my deck and practice one one notch on a stick. And so that's where the idea came from. And it was funny because my girlfriend came out and, and asked me randomly, are you using each of your knives to do this or are you just using one? And that's when the idea dawned on me that, yeah, I have all these knives. And when I originally bought them, it was never a question of, of do I know how to use the knife? It was almost as if, like we were joking about a minute ago, does the knife know how to use itself? And it's that same security blanket theory. And it, and a lot of it, I think the deepest root of that is, is an inherent laziness that we have in, and maybe it's an unintended consequence or, or a bad byproduct of the convenience society that, that we have now created, which is both wonderful and bad because now we have this laziness where if I just buy something, my problem will go away. Well, I'll even come at it from a slightly different angle. I, I think you're right. There is a little bit of laziness to it. But there's also this piece that, you know, as people in modern society, I'm not even going to say Americans because I don't think it's just us. I think it's Europeans, Americans. It's people all over the world who have been living in first world nations and, and dealing with technology. It's this whole idea that you look at some of these things and you think back to what your great grandfather might have been doing. And you think uh, by the time he was. 13 or 15 or 14 or 12 or whatever the age might have been, he could probably do all those notches or he could probably take a stick and a line and make a, a you know, fishing rod for himself and, and all these other things. And you think to yourself, I'm now 30, 35, 40, 45, whatever you might be listening. And I don't know how to do any of that. So I want to know it yesterday. So I'm just going to buy the tool. And if my grandfather could do it at 12, well, then obviously I'll be able to do it, too. I think a lot of that that thought process, it, there is a little bit of laziness in it, but it's also this like it's that sitting, hoping, waiting, wishing concept. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I would agree if I that. just have it, then the knowledge will end up in my head. And that way I've and it's almost this desire to like I said, it's that desire to have had it yesterday. Yeah. There's a lot. I'm doing so many other things in life. I got to go to work. I got to do X. I got to do Y. I got to do Z. I've got kids, family, whatever it might be. And all of a sudden, all these things that I want to do become difficult. So if I could just take that pill, <laughs> then I'll have all this knowledge or hook myself up to that machine or read it on the Internet. I will know exactly what to do. Well, reading it on the Internet always does that, which is yep. funny for us to say since since we have a blog, too. And, and that's a lot of what I end up doing with my day. But at least I try to fact check the vast majority of what I do. But, right. Well, that and you're you're out there, like you said, you get home and you tried it and you you see how it works. Yeah. But it really is so easy to get caught up in the I w I, I want to know this so bad and I'm I want to know 50 different things so bad that I won't make the time for any one of them because I want to know all of them. Mm -hmm. So I'll just buy all the tools and and hope that it just comes to me via osmosis. Yeah, and I think that's in a lot of ways and that will kind of end up relating to one of the one of the last things that we covered which is 360 degree thinking mm -hmm. but i think a lot of people are so you know and, and i was talking with john heatherly uh, the author of uh, the cave in the sea uh, a few days ago when we were talking about something and he was telling me there was this yeah it's a long convoluted story that i can't really go into but it was essentially that someone didn't know enough to even think or fathom that there was so much more. And I think it was a conversation about firecraft and the guy was basically saying, well, you can't, you can't just tell me everything that I have would ever need to know in five minutes about firecraft. And it was like, no, I we could spend five days and I may not even get to everything. And that is so true. And, and an example of that would, and I kind of, Put a little bit of that in the last uh, last week's Friday Gear Report, which was when I got a call and there was like a continuing education thing through CERT. And unfortunately, the person that scheduled was doing the scheduling for the class. It was a cl class on how to use chainsaw. And the person that was doing the scheduling accidentally 
only scheduled it for one day and it was actually a two day course. And then when I showed up, I had only budgeted time for being there for what they had was originally on the schedule. But I found out that the course was going to be two days and I'm standing there going, how can it be? I mean, I'm, I'm saying the same stupid thing that this other person did, but just because I didn't know well enough, but it was that this course was going to be two days. I'm like, how can you have a two day course on chainsaws? And man, we get in about two hours into the class and I'm like, I don't even know how we would fit everything into two days. And actually one of the instructors said, yeah, no, this is two days and we're just kind of, <laughs> it's just the tip of the iceberg. Well, I mean, even thinking to that, uh, we did what, a two hour knife sharpening class? Yeah. Yeah. We probably could have spent a week. Oh, easily. Just, and, and that was just on the basics. Mm-hmm. Easily. And, and it could have taken years, and, and I'm not even kidding when I say this, years to truly become as good as the person who was teaching that class. Oh, yeah. Um, if you ever got there. Yeah, because that guy was doing in about five minutes what was taking the rest of us to do to do badly. I mean, he was doing right. it like amazing. And he could do it all by feel. Job. Yeah, and he was doing an amazing job in five minutes, and the rest of us were doing a shitty job in an hour. Right. And it really does go back to it doesn't matter what you're holding in your hands if you don't actually know how to use it. Right. And even going back to th- this false sense of security, which is really what what the the guy in the original story that you started off were talking about with the shotgun. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the same thing with with a home alarm. It's not and I experienced that when my house got broken into a couple of years ago. I had an alarm and and as a matter of fact, the most annoying part was I had just had the alarm installed, but it was over a holiday and it was at a weird hour in the morning and it was in the middle of a shift change at, at the nearest police station in my house. And I was away from home and the police didn't respond for, I want to say it was around about an hour to the alarm going off. And the officer showed up and was very apologetic, but the, the alarm system was good. I mean, it alerted me and I actually got managed to leave the hotel I was at and got home before the officers even showed up. But it didn't prevent the robbery. All it did was alert me and alert the police that the robbery was taking place. And so, and you know, it's funny because when I, when I leave my house, sometimes I, I get a little anxious. It's like, oh crap, did I set the alarm or did I not set the alarm? And it always makes me laugh. Cause I'm like, you know what? I lived in this house for uh, just off the top of my head. I think it was about four, 12 or 14 years before I ever had an alarm. And right. I, I never had this apprehension leaving, but now I have this, this sense of security that is immediately taken away because I'm now I'm used to, Oh, well, if something happens to my home, I will pretty much immediately know. Mm -hmm. And it really is. It's that's the problem with rushing out. And I don't even know if there's a way around it for a lot of new people. Cause I know one of the, we've joked around about our bug out bags so many times, but that in and itself, bug out bags can also be very much a false sense of security because that only hides you over through a very specific set of situations. Yeah, I, that idea that I've got something and now I'm secure mm-hmm. in general is, it, I think as we go through the rest of the mindsets, it'll become more clear, but it's it's a very um, short-sighted view. Mm-hmm. It's yes, if you have a shotgun and you know how to use it and someone comes into your home and you happen to be there and you can get to your shotgun in time, well, sure, then it will probably do exactly what it was intended to do. But there's a lot of if statements that got to that final point. It's kind of like, yes, if you are home when a bad thing happens and you're right next to your bug out bag and it isn't an earthquake that prevents you from getting to the part of your house where your bug out bag is. And there's a series of other events that occur that just happen to be right. And you can now get to your car with your bug out bag and your family and their bug out bags. Well, then, yep, it'll do everything it's supposed to do. Yeah. (laughs) to move on to part two and it's something that drives me nuts but at the same and we talked about it a second ago even i'll just go to the internet and learn yeah but well more specifically than the internet and and i'm also Mm -hmm. going to preface the same one that this is not something that i have myself have not fallen victim to which is the idea that fiction is not fact so if you read a book, and now there are very specific instances where the author has taken the time and energy and has the background and can, in a moment's notice, point out exactly where the information came from and provide it to people. 
And to kind of pimp our friend John Heatherly's book a little bit, The Cave in the Sea is a great example of that because it is a really great fictional story. And he found ways of interjecting really great survival skills in it. But he went beyond that and he has gone out and he has started sharing not only excerpts from the book, but then also coming back, giving you the practical skill and giving you the resource or the the practical skill. And which just reminded me the this week and next week, there will be two of those articles coming out on Wednesdays that are on Wednesday that are really cool. But to go on to that, somebody brought it up recently and it really got under my skin. And I think it got under my skin in part because it's something I've done too, which is to make a point and vehemently just grab onto it and be like, this is the way it is because it's something that we read from a piece of survival fiction. Right. It, be, it becomes common knowledge, not because it's actually common knowledge, but because we all read the same thing in the same book. Yeah. And what was, what's the expression if you were repeat a lie three times becomes truth i think we just exactly. yeah i think we were throwing that around for a while yeah i don't remember where we saw it but uh i like it a lot yeah. <laughs> and so i think the, that is so true in fiction and there is a book that if you've never read it it is a great piece of survival fiction and there is a lot of very interesting and thought-provoking ideas in the book and the book's called one second after but at no point did the author give links or real references as to where to go find this information. And there's actually a a study that is referenced in the book that I have been looking for going on three years now, and I've never found it. And it is a it was a government study conducted, I think, in the 50s that details out very specific steps of how a society breaks down if the infrastructure goes out of whack. And it's not to say it doesn't exist. It's just I can't find it and the author never referenced it anywhere. It's not on his website. It's not in the book. It's not anywhere. It was just you're listening to a conversation between two or reading a conversation between two characters in a book. One of them mentions this study and it sounds really good. It sounds completely like something a government would do and probably should do, which is do an analysis of what happens. And it wouldn't surprise me if it's been done. And there is a no. study out there. It's just, I know you've been searching for it for years now. Yeah. It's not because I want to prove or disprove the author. It's because it sounded fascinating to me and I wanted to read it and I wanted to see what it had to say. I feel like the information would probably be a little outdated, but in a lot of ways it would still be relevant. It would be useful information. No. And, you know, it's just fun survival reading in, in a lot of ways. It's it's because we're survival geeks. It's because we're survival geeks. I, I'll own that title. But until I find that study, to me, it's still fiction. It's good right. fiction. It's it's extremely plausible fiction, but it is not yet fact. And you know what? We've seen that a lot, not just in that book, but you'll find that in forums, there will be studies quoted, ideas quoted. And when you finally get to where people got it from, it's, well, I got it in this book, which is a work of fiction that, again, may provoke great thought. I, I think that's one of the things we need to differentiate here. It's not to say that fiction can and shouldn't provoke wonderful thought. It should get you really thinking about things. It should get the juices flowing. If you don't get into it and it doesn't make your brain work, then there probably wasn't a point in reading it in the first place. But at the same time, just because it made you think and just because it got the juices flowing doesn't mean what you read was fact. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we need to that I think that's the point here, which is fiction is not an academic study. It's a maybe a philosophical study. You and I both, and we've we've done it in our own private time, and we don't really do it on the show, but we've sat and waxed and waned about all kinds of crazy stuff and and, oh, yeah. and, and solved all kinds of problems we will probably never ever see. I, I sincerely hope not. <laughs> But and come up with extravagant plans and everything else. And but we admit when we're doing it that it's mental masturbation. It, it's fictional. It's not we can't base anything that we're talking about because when we're doing it, we're talking out our ass. Right. Well, I think for both of us, sometimes even admitting not I'm not going to say admitting it's hard, but sometimes pulling yourself back out of that discussion so that you can look at it rationally and go, OK, we just figured out exactly what to do when the. uh the giant ants attack the planet, but <laughs> damn ants. <laughs> most likely, that's not a scenario we'll be in. And I, you know, I'm using a crazy, extreme, nutty point there, but 
it could be anything. It could be, you know, yeah, we figured out exactly what to do when that nuclear attack happens in Dallas. But the reality <laughs> of it is we don't really know. <laughs> no, no. And, and unfortunately, we don't have access a lot to some of the more extreme stuff. We don't have access to those kinds of people because they probably still work for the government. Right. They're not allowed to talk to us. Yeah, exactly. So the idea here is that if you're going to read fiction, I'm all for it. And I, I do love myself some good survival fiction. But it's always when you close the book and set it down, you have to remember it is survival fiction. And there can be some great ideas, but they are purely theoretical. And they, are, they, they can have some basis of, in truth. But until you can see some historical evidence and some academic studies behind it, it's still fiction. Right. Um, and I think the the point that the person that I kind of got into it a little bit with was talking about that bullets uh, as a means of trade. And I didn't disagree with the point. I'm just saying if we're going to talk about it, let's not point to fiction to back up a point. Let's point to some historical evidence where we can see where societies have collapsed and that has actually taken place. Now we can have a real conversation. Now we can point to something and say that happened and it happened here and we have real evidence of it happening. And there was there was there were some pieces from one second after that I that I can actually point to some historical references and research where it really was real. And there's been, I think, one of the the most interesting studies is what happened in kind of the Bosnia-Croatian area where how barter took place with weapons, with bullets, with food, with medicine, and how the priority of those different barter items, it became a real economy where on a day-to-day basis, the the value of those items shifted based on people's needs. Right. There's a long time history of that. Actually, I I can't remember who said the quote, but it goes something like, you know, money is not a government construct. Uh, money is actually a concept that goes back to the beginning of man. We can call it barter. We can call it what we want. But as soon as you use an object to exchange for another good, it's money. Mm-hmm. And that concept isn't, has nothing to do with the paper money issued by a government. It is the whole idea that there will always be exchange for goods. And that's why referencing that in a book like One Second After makes perfect sense. I mean, e- there is no, you don't need a study to prove it either. That's, it's something that history has shown time and time and time and time again, that when the paper stuff that governments hand out fall apart, then we just revert back to using other products of value. Mm-hmm. To move on to the next one, which is what we've called the disaster matrix, just to shorten it, but it's, it's actually, to give full credit, it is Jack Spearco of the Survival Podcasts idea that he came up with, which he calls the threat probability matrix. And the idea behind that, and it truly is a brilliant idea, is that it's about probability versus concern, or a better way to put it is probability over concern. The idea is that there is a very distinguished inverse relationship between the size and scope of a threat and its probability. The larger a threat and the more impact it has, the less likely it is to take place. So, for an example, a nuclear war. Now, I know there's a lot of people that worry about a nuclear war, but somebody really has to make a very serious commitment that all other options are lost and that the only way for them to win is no longer through diplomatic or conventional warfare methods. It's just to completely and utterly annihilate the guy on the other end. Right. And I think that's the critical point, though. It's it's the cost of doing these great big things mm-hmm. is so high that it really is a it's always a last ditch effort. Yeah. And if we look at something less man made or not less not man made, which would be a giant meteor striking the Earth, there is a probability to that, but it is is a very small probability in comparison to the size of the devastation. So if we have a meteor or comet or whatever you want to think of smacking into the earth, that is something that is global. It affects everyone on the planet. Life is either screwed or pretty close to it, but the probability is very low compared to the size and impact. Well, I think that's an easy one too. If it had a high probability, we'd be seeing it more often. Well, exactly, exactly. And on the opposite end of that spectrum, would be 
something that is a personal disaster, losing a loved one and all of the life interrupts that come from that, losing a job and financial security. We're well, we're still in a recession. And so we're still I mean, I am sure everyone in this show still knows someone that is unemployed and legitimately looking for work. Right. So that is something that is extremely probable, but it's isolated to an individual rather than an entire planet or even that it's a local thing or a regional thing. That is the idea and the concept behind it. And we are going to put a link in the show notes today to the original episode where uh, Jack Spearco introduced the concept. So you can actually go listen to the guy who created the concept, talk about it. But it really is a a very important concept. And and thankfully, it has caught on largely in the survival community by the more rationally minded people that the idea is and what the point that the concept makes is to focus first on the most probable focus first on that things that are going to go wrong are more probably going to be isolated to you or to your family yeah and i think he's he's pretty clear about it you know when you start getting down to that uh drawing out the targets the bullseye is you Mm -hmm. and as it gets further away from the bullseye the less probable it becomes and you know he even talks about uh personal loss people people close to you passing away Mm mm-hmm that's more likely to happen than some of the other things out there. Losing yeah. a job, all of that. Those are things you should be much more prepared for than, you know, that giant shit hits the fan scenario. The important takeaway, the mentality that this concept provides is because a lot of preppers, and I would easily venture to say most preppers, started off in prep because there was a single event that either happened in their life and got them into prep or They saw something or thought of something and decided this major calamity launches them into preparedness. And the trouble with that is now we're focusing on this giant nebulous concept that is not probable. Now, if you take that back a step and if you approach it from the opposite end, which is to prepare for the probable. So if we're looking at it from that point, then we can say, okay, easily. Storing food makes sense because I can lose a job or I can, anything can happen. And if I have food, then that is one of my major priorities in life that I'm able to feed myself and my family, that that's now taken care of, at least for a reasonable amount of time to get through whatever the issue is, whether it was climatic, whether it was losing a job, whatever it was. And then getting out of debt that has so many benefits that are in the here and now. Yeah, that will... It keeps you out of trouble, and if you do get into trouble, it prevents you from getting into deeper trouble. Yeah, exactly. The benefits are so numerous when you start looking at it from that direction, because that's where we get into talking about preparing in such a way that it benefits your life in the here and now, in the today, when nothing has gone wrong yet. Also prepares you for when things do go wrong. And the idea is in using the threat probability matrix, so you start prepping with personal in mind. And then from there, you slowly move out. And then you find a point that is comfortable for you. And that's not to say you don't prepare for if there is a major calamity that is of concern to you, that's not that you don't prepare for it. That's not what we're saying. We're not presuming to tell you not to do that. What we are saying is if you start off from the beginning and work your way out, you will at any point of the way probably be about 80% of the way prepared for that major event. Whereas if you're only focusing on a major catastrophe, you're not watching out for all the other things that can happen and you're not making sure that what you're doing in your preparations are of benefit to your health today or going back to getting out of debt. If you're worried about a solar flare or something like that and you say, well, the solar flare is coming in a year, for whatever reason you are convinced that the solar, or or 2012, whatever it is, you're convinced that it's going to happen then, it's very easy to say, well, I'm just going to run up all my credit card. I'm going to max them all out. I'm going to buy every last piece of survival, whatever. And I'm not going to worry about it because in a year, none of that's going to matter anymore. Well, <laughs> what happens if that doesn't? And you got what are credit cards on average now? 25% interest rate. Yeah, that's probably about right. 19 so, to 30, somewhere in there. So now you've prepared for an event and screwed yourself on a more personal level 
that may or may never happen. Right. And if you were right and the solar flare does happen, well, you know, you can pat yourself on the back. But again, looking at these odds and statistically speaking, you know, prepare for that worst case scenario, but also make sure you're very well prepared if it doesn't happen. Yeah. Prepare from the beginning and move forward. Move out in expanding well circles. Yeah. Well put. And that also kind of segues us into myopic preparedness, which we did an episode on what did we call it? Seven deadly sins of preparedness or something like yes, that? Yes. Yeah. It was the seven deadly sins. And so those were the seven different common ways that we as preppers have a tendency to focus on something to the point where we don't have balance in our preparation, which is important because if we're too focused on bullets, we don't feed ourselves. If we're too focused on feeding ourselves, we don't protect ourselves. And, and in all of these different di- directions, I'm not going to try to recap that entire show, but the idea is in a nutshell, what it's myopic preparedness. It's where we focus on one single thing. Just like we were talking about a minute ago, it's you're so focused on that one single thing. Well, what if that thing doesn't happen? How, how does the rest of your life go on? How does the rest of your day, your month, your week, whatever, how, do, how does that go on? And how do the people around you go on? You've put all of your energy into something, may or may never happen. To, to kind of go into how this catches you off guard, there's a great book, and it's called The Black Swan. And in part, the root of the concept is essentially a black swan is something that 9-11 in a lot of ways is referred to as a black swan for most people. Before it happened, it was completely inconceivable because we'd never seen it before. And for an extremely small set of people that that was their job was to dream up stuff like that, it was not a black swan. But for everyone else, it was something that had never been seen before. So it didn't exist and couldn't exist. And the idea comes from that, uh, I want to say, and I'm not going to probably do this justice, but essentially it was, if you go back 100 years in Britain, the idea was that swans were white and they had never seen their... A black swan was completely inconceivable. Swans were always white until one day somebody saw a black swan and then it was just this massive mental shift, I guess, for for people that liked swans. But the idea is that if if you're not looking around you and if you're solely focused on that one thing, you won't see the other things that could potentially go wrong. And it's a good way to get blindsided. For instance, let's say we're driving in a car and we have blinders on, and all we can see is what's in front of us. That is our, our sole focus of concern, and all we're worried about is either people hitting us in a head-on collision or slamming on their brakes and us ramming into the back of them. Well, we miss the people that could potentially come at us from side streets, or we miss the child who kicks the ball out into the street and then runs out into the street after the ball, or the dog, or the cat, or the squirrel. Eh, run over the squirrel. The point is... If you are hyper-focused on something, then you're missing the opportunity to have a balanced preparations. Right. I mean, to put that in perspective, you know, using a few of these examples all in one shot, that whole idea of if I am so focused on that solar flare and I am so prepped for that solar flare, then when I lose a job and my debt starts getting called in, and a loved one passes away, which are all very likely things to occur, or much more likely than the solar flare, then you won't even be ready for those things because you have been so just myopically focused on that one thing out there. Exactly. Which also brings us into the concept of 360-degree thinking, which I think the first time anybody really kind of coined that for me was uh, at, at work. And that was... In the first day, my boss said, I want you to always be thinking in 360 degrees. And I didn't really get exactly what he meant at first. And then after really getting into the job and really understanding and a little further explanation, it was in that sense, it was in dealing with people. And, and the idea was that, and, and this was not a new concept. It was just a different way of putting it. I think uh, Stephen Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, I think he put it as seeking first to understand before and then be understood. And so it's this this idea that you're trying to step out of yourself and understand what's going on around you first and then worrying about 
what's going on with you. And in 360 degree thinking, it's looking at all the possible things. And that can be a little overwhelming, but that's where we get why it's so important to start from the base and move forward. Because if you try to prepare for everything all at once, one, you'll realize that there is a commonality to all of them. And two, you'll realize that you can't, A, without spending just insane amounts of money. And even then, I don't know that it's possible. And B, making yourself just completely insane and apprehensive and fear-based in your decisions. You have to take a look around and you have to, and and this is a, a habit to use. It's great with using with people, understanding what they need and where they come from, as well as understanding what potential issues are out there in the world and how they'll how they'll affect the people around you and how they'll affect you and how they'll affect your preparations if they even do at all. That's actually a good point. You know, even in prepping, how it affects your family, how your family's attitudes affect you. Uh, thinking broader than just prepping for the event. It's it's prepping for your family, for your household and, and taking a look around and seeing how those things impact everyone. Absolutely. And 360 degree thinking, and the, one of the reasons I brought up the, the human aspect of doing that was because that's very important. When you try to speak to someone else, because let's face it, that's one of our greatest assets for preparation is having as many other preppers around us and in our communities as possible. And if you're not approaching somebody and speaking to them in a manner that you first thought of in a 360 degree manner, which is to understand that they probably have never thought of any of this stuff. And most of their lives, they're so busy worrying about, I got to feed my kids. I got to make a car note. I got to make a house note. I got to get that promotion. You know, whatever things are going on in their lives that they are, again, hyper-focused on and not seeing everything going on around them, potentially, well, then if you walk up and try to tell them the world's going to end tomorrow, the that's a lot to take in. And it's kind of like you're immediately going to be the nut job. Now you've thrown a black swan at them that is so far outside their understanding they can't even wrap their mind around it. To then move on to kind of one of the final mindsets, and this is something that we did an entire series on, which is organization and planning. And the idea is that it's organization and planning over reaction. What are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish, both in your life and in your preparations? And how are you going to get there? And are you doing things out of a reaction? Or are you doing things because you've sat down and clearly thought things through, all of them? You know, we also did a whole show about burnout. And one of the things that always worries me about uh when I see, when I talk to people about this, because yeah, I think Aaron, you and I have probably talked to more people about this in the last uh, six to nine months. You know, we started the show over a year ago, but in the last six to nine months, people really are coming out of everywhere and, and seeking us out for uh, answers, opinions, advice, whatever it might be. One of the things I figured out is when people do this organization planning overreaction, they burn out faster. They, they become disinterested. It becomes too much to handle. And it really, it's because they put themselves in that situation. That's the other part of where organization and planning comes in. As you, if you clearly look at it and think, I only have so many hours in a week to do so much. I only have so much money to do so many things all at once. And you realize, I'm going to do what I can in the amount of time and with the resources I have available to me. Because anything other than that is the old expression, pissing in the wind. All you're doing is worrying for nothing. You're spinning yourself up for for no good reason and freaking yourself out that, oh my God, I can't afford X and we can't afford a bug out location or we can't do this or we can't do that and or we can't do it fast enough. Really, what you realize is you have to do what you can do in the amount of time with the resources you have available to you and that is the best you can do. And that's where organization and planning, aside from making ideas, not these nebulous clouds that you'll maybe never achieve, but actually giving you a clear path to understand what you can do with what you have. And with that, we're going to wrap up episode 65. Thank you for joining us. This has been an episode from the In the Rabbit Hole Urban Survival Podcast. You can learn more by visiting intherabbithole.com. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more great survival stuff.